we have our final speaker for today, Paul Chisano. Paul is co-founder and CEO of Unison Computing. He's the man whose brainchild Unison was in the first place. And he's going to deliver the state of the Unison address, <laughs> telling us what's happening with Unison lately and where it's headed in the future. Paul? All right. Um, by the way, that was... That was Runar's idea, the state of the Unison address. Uh, I thought it was kind of hokey, but uh, but went with it. Um, so, yeah. So, I'll let me just get started. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to our first ever Unison conference. Um, it has been a blast uh, getting to to meet all y'all and uh, and yeah, just thank thanks so much to all the speakers and and you know participants who, who helped helped make this a success. Um, also wanted to give a shout out to all the people who have helped uh, build Unison and get it to where it is today. Um, so we have uh, closed, uh, just on the main Unison repo, we have closed over uh, 1,200 pull requests, 254 of those are uh, from you, the community. We have uh, 27 people who have contributed in some way to the Unison base library. Uh, there are 52 projects uh, published on the current version of Share, even though the process for publishing is a bit janky. Of course, it's going to be getting much better um, with the, the new version of Share that, that Simon talked about. Um, and then just even people who you know you're not necessarily people who are not necessarily writing Unison code, but just people who are following along with the project, um, it, you know maybe retweeting us, saying nice things, uh, maybe just lurking in in the Slack, um, like just being a part of the community at least on the edges, like that is also just uh, means a lot to us, and it's just um, it's it's great hearing from people that, you know, you like the direction that, that, you know, we're headed with Unison and that's just very encouraging. And so thank you for, for, for being a member of the Unison community. Um, I wanted to say a, a little bit about Unison computing the company. Um, so we are a public benefit corp. Um, our mission is twofold. We want to advance uh, what is possible with software. Um, but we don't want to just build like the super advanced technology that, that no one uses uh, or is like super hard to understand. We want to build um, practical tools that, that programmers can use in their day-to-day -day work. And in general, we want to make software creation simpler and accessible, more accessible to more people. Um, and then in terms of like the business side of the company, so the way we plan to make money is... Uh, with uh, this cloud service, uh, Unison Cloud, where you know we we will be, uh, you know we have a we will have a free tier, but then we'll have paid tiers uh, where you can you know pay for compute, storage, services, and and so forth. And um, so, I guess I for this talk, I I thought uh, I could cover a, a few things. So I want to let's look at maybe where Unison is today, and what are some areas that I think uh, still need work. Um, then I wanted to talk about five things that I am very excited about for the future of, of Unison. Um, this is like stuff that hasn't already been talked about. So I'm, I'm very excited about the stuff that you've already, uh, seen, uh, and that people talked about earlier. Um, these are, these are new things that are, that are on the horizon that, that, uh, I, I've been thinking about a lot and I think are exciting. And then uh, just have some closing thoughts. So uh, what are some things that, that still need work? So um, first of all, just I guess overall, what I want to say about all these things is that these are all uh, very doable. You know, there's really nothing fundamentally stopping us from improving in, in any of these areas. So one is performance. So just performance of the, um, the core, you know, core language and runtime. Um, and yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel really good, uh, even though Unison's, uh, runtime performance is not like, uh, going to break any records. Um, yeah, we, we are, uh, actively, or Dan is act working on this just in time compiler for Unison and that is looking super promising. 
And so I feel like we're going to be in good shape there. But um, yeah, this, that's definitely an area that's it's active, actively being worked on uh, today. And I don't think it's where it needs to be um, right, right, uh, right now. Um, okay. The, the next two points. Um, so there, there's some, some things around the um, current experience of working with uh, and collaborating on unison code that, um, so let's take the refactoring process. So Unison has this beautiful, super nice uh, conceptual model for the refactoring process where your code base is never in a broken state. Um, you never have a big misleading list of type errors. Um, you know, your code base is always live. Like there's sort of all these nice uh, conceptual properties, but then I think in practice, the current, uh, you know, UCM, uh, work workflow for like actually going through a refactoring is like it has a bunch of rough edges and there's some bugs and just like some things that are make it so that it's not living up to its promise and um we uh basically haven't we haven't really spent too much time uh working on this recently because we've been so focused on trying to get both unison share and unison cloud out the door um but uh, I think once once those uh, once those do ship, uh, I, I would love to to get back to you know making sure that the that the developer experience is is really great for for refactoring, which it it absolutely can be, and um, I think Unison has a much better story than most other uh, programming languages. Um, the other thing is. Um, and this is this is on the short term road roadmap for Unison Share is just having a nice uh, pull request and collaboration story where you know you can do the things that, that people expect of you know creating pull requests and uh, you know commenting on them and things like that. Um, and I think uh, yeah, so this is on a short short term roadmap for for Unison Share. Uh, probably be one of the first things that we build out, and uh, but it, it is super important. And um, you know this is, this is an area that we that we uh, need to, need to focus on in the short term. Um, okay, and then this last point is like, yeah, Unison's ecosystem is very young, and there's just there's not a lot of libraries, um, and I think that's normal for a young uh, programming language. But uh, yeah, this is definitely an area where all of you can can help out. Um, if you are trying to get something done and you find that, you know, a library is missing, um, you know, and, and you're able to, to write a library for it, uh, you can help, help grow the Unison ecosystem, um, you know, building open source libraries. So um, these are all things that I want to uh, improve in, in the short term. And these are all very doable things. And, you know, we just have to kind of keep turning the crank and, and uh, keep making progress in these areas. Um, but just wanted to let you know that these are things that are certainly on my mind and uh, maybe they're on your mind too, uh, if you've been using um, Unison day to day more. Okay, so, okay, let's now switch to some more future thinking, fu uh, future looking uh, stuff. So. These are five things that I am excited about. So the first is, this is sort of a general idea, is um, the Unison distributed computing ecosystem. So we have this uh, really nice uh, distributed programming API, um, which it was co-designed with, with Heather Miller and you know, for the, the purpose was for it to be a, a very general purpose uh, substrate for expressing all kinds of distributed computations. And uh, so far, so good. Uh, you know, basically every everything that we have tried to throw at it of like, oh, could we could we express this kind of thing or, or that kind of thing uh, has worked out really nicely with the, with this. Um, with this uh, core set of primitives. And so, yeah, we built like a Spark-like library. Um, yeah, just recently, uh, Heather and I, we 
kind of started on the CRDTs library. Um, I worked on like a distributed hash table uh, implementation. Um, and yeah, so it seems like a very flexible general framework. But the thing that is, is super exciting is that um, basically all of these, all of the, the libraries and things that can be built on top of this uh, core set of primitives, they all can just work nicely together. And so you can have this compositional, um, uh, you, 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 can, you can actually have composition at the level of distributed computing components. So I gave, this is just, um, you know, a, uh, just to try, I'm trying to paint a picture here. Uh, but uh, so here's, here's wh what is this? Uh, we're saying, okay, create a distributed cron job. Uh, so every hour we're, we are going to wake up, we're gonna read some distributed CRDT and do a MapReduce job on it. So this is like combining three different what would what would today be like three different you know big frameworks that that probably don't even talk to each other, um, and now all of these uh, all of these bits of functionality are just sort of a function call away, and we can just combine them seamlessly in a uh, distributed program. Um, and so, yeah, so this this kind of thing of like there being a whole ecosystem of uh, distributed computing libraries that all sort of compile down to the to the same uh, underlying primitives. Okay, um, all right. The next idea. Uh, so, and we're just honestly we're we're just at the at the we've just scratched the surface in this area. Like uh, there are a million ideas for you know distributed computing components and libraries that have yet to be written. And uh, it's like the sky's the limit. There's, there's just uh, a ton of, um, ton of opportunities to, to uh, help, help grow this ecosystem. Um, I was talking to uh, uh, somebody recently about, oh, they were like, oh, curious about uh, maybe implementing Raft in Unison. And they, you know, uh, st started uh, reading up on that and, and you know, and like that's exactly the kind of thing. It's like, oh well, no, no one's implemented Raft, and uh, but then someone can implement that, and then now that's just like another tool in this in this um, toolkit that you have access to when you're building your distributed programs. Okay, the next idea is a bit more technical. Um, so this is a um, the, the idea is incremental distributed compute. So a lot of times you have a, um, you have some distributed computation, like suppose it's a batch job and you know, you run it once on like, I don't know, say the, the data set is like the Wikipedia and you run it uh, once and you, you know, maybe it parses all the pages in the Wikipedia and does some transformations to it and, and some statistics and then eventually like comes out, you know, spits out some, some results in the end. So um, if you want to take that same computation and run it on, uh, you know, Wikipedia uh, tomorrow, so maybe there's like a few new pages that have been created and, but, but largely the data set is the same uh, or it's, it's mostly the same. Um, wouldn't it be great if the amount of time it took to recompute that computation was uh, proportional to how much the data had changed? And you imagine if you could just sort of get that for free without like having to uh, jump through a bunch of hoops or, or like, I don't know, be manually writing out checkpoints to S3 buckets or some crazy thing that you know you you probably are not going to bother to do because because it's too complicated. Um, so the um, there's there's sort of a neat idea um, that we can apply here that I think we're going to get a lot of mileage out of, and we're we're really only seeing the beginnings of of how much we can get out of it. Um, and it's kind of actually similar to what Unison already does um, for like its compilation cache or its evaluation cache. So, you know, we never compile or type check uh, the same functions more than once, right? 
Like once we've type checked it, we then store the results of type checking uh, in this append only uh, store, which is your code base, which is keyed by the hash. And that's great. And it sort of, that gives us perfect incremental compilation. Um, and we do the same thing with our, like the watch, watch expression cache. So this is really just like, hey, why don't we take that same idea and apply it at the level of uh, distributed computations as well? So I was going to show, um, so the thing about distributed computations that is interesting is that they are typically, I mean, any sort of large computation, a lot of times you can uh, uh, express it as some recursive function. And so uh, I it, give an example here of fold left, uh, you know, fold left of plus zero over one, two, three, four. So that is in turn, uh, you know, composed of, or it requires evaluate, evaluation of uh, fold left of zero, you know, the list one, two, three, and then adding four to that. Um, also, this is true if you have like a balanced fold where you're splitting the list in half instead of, um, you know, doing one element at a time. But the point is that um, why don't we just cache the um, results of a function? We'll, well, first of all, we'll hash a function and its arguments and then cache uh, based on that. So um, the... Um, in unison, one of the things you can do is you can compute the hash of uh, with different hashing algorithms. You can compute the hash of any value at all in the language, including functions. So I can compute the hash of the thunk, uh, you know, fold left zero, uh, you know. I can compute the hash of these, of these uh, steps of the fold and then basically memoize that. Uh, so basically keep track of those uh, cache results in uh, just a table or really just any, any append only store. And then um, now when we evaluate, uh, you know, fold left uh, on like a data set, we can um, not have to, if it, if we've seen, you know, if we've, if we've already like com computed it for like a smaller list and then we've just added an element to it, then we don't necessarily need to go all the way back to the beginning and like fold over the whole list again. So fold, uh, fold left is giving, the, giving us this sort of incremental computation, uh, at least as long as we're just sort of adding events to the, to the end of the list. Um, okay, um, I think I'm gonna skip over this, but there, so, well, okay, so, um, the this this example that that I showed with like fold left and a list, um, you know, this I'm I was kind of just trying to show the idea of of how we can cache uh, function results based on their hash. But um, when we're doing these distributed computations, the data sets that we're operating on they don't uh, necessarily fit in memory on one machine, and um, even just computing the hash. Uh, you might think like, oh, well, do I have to traverse the whole data set to compute the hash? And um, it turns out that you don't. You can, what you can do is you can represent uh, these distributed sequences uh, as a Merkle tree. So it's, it's like a tree where um, the reference, some of the ref, so let's, let me just kind of walk through this, this code a little bit. So, um, a hashed A, uh, so the A is just sort of a phantom type. It's it's just there for, um, you know, sort of like metadata on what kind of thing this hash is meant to represent. But um, so hashed A is just a sort of a typed hash um, where hash is just, you know, uh, the, the result of, you know, uh, of hashing a unison uh, uh, function or value. And then a Merkle seek is empty. It's one. It's or it's two. But then notice that the the two um, subtrees of the Merkle seek are um, they're not 
a Merkle seek, they're a hashed Merkle seek. So um, what that means is that um, you know if I have a if I have a Merkle seek, it is uh, you know going to be constant time to compute a hash of it because we don't have to like go all the way down to the leaves of the tree. We only have to look uh, basically at the first level of the tree to compute the hash. And um, and then in terms of like the way that you program against um, some a, a Merkley data structure like this is you use some ability uh, that just sort of uh, abstracts over any sort of content addressed storage. So this is a really simple one where um, it just has two operations. You can save an A, you get back a hashed A, uh, and then restore is like, given a hashed A, you get back an A in memory. Um, and the, this sort of, this kind of append only storage, uh, there's like lots of ways that it can be implemented. Um, but, um, then when you, so this for instance is in terms of when you're writing operations on a Merkle seek, you just get to, um, uh, it's, it's and actually ends up being very similar to, to, you know, if it were just like an in-memory tree structure. Um, I won't go through the code in detail, but you basically just have a few calls to save and restore. Uh, and, um, and you can give this kind of treatment to just about any data structure you can imagine. So, you know, you, you can make Merkley versions of, you know, of sets, of maps, of, you know, suffix trees, you know, whatever, whatever fancy data structures you want. And, um, and then that in turn gives us a way of memoizing computations over those data structures. Um, and so that is sort of giving a, a really nice story for, for uh, these incremental computations over large data sets. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot more to say about that, but uh, this is just an area where I feel like it's very un underexplored. And also there's, you know, it's just, it would otherwise be really hard to do this kind of thing. And uh, I think the, the, the hashing stuff is, is giving us a really nice approach to the problem. Okay. Um, this is a little bit more uh, speculative, but um, I am excited about developing a beautiful functional API for writing services. So I would say that the current uh, Unison distributed API is, I mean, I guess you, you, you can use it to write services, but it's at, I would say, too low, low, low a level. Um, and I, I really would like a higher level uh, API for, for writing services. And um, so here is the one slide uh, sketch of what that might look like. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, shout out to uh, Fabio Labella, who uh, he and I were, were jamming on this uh, together. Um, but uh, sort of the, here, here's kind of a, a key idea is that um, we, when you're building a service that, so the thing that dis distinguishes a service from say just a function is that the service has some state that is evolving, you know, as, as the service is running. Um, so if you just have a function, like there's, there's really no, you know, there, there's, there's nothing to it. Uh, you know, you just, you just have a function and maybe you, if you need, whatever, you need to wrap a HTTP endpoint around it, fine. But um, services are these stateful things where they're, you know, they're, they're accumulating some information over time. Um, so uh, the idea behind this is a, there's like this core abstraction of, I'm calling it a multi-series. So um, a multi-series is like, you know, rather than just like a single series of values, uh, like on one computer, a multi-series is uh, potentially it, a, sing, a, a single multi-series uh, could represent, um, 
you know, hundreds of con concurrent uh, series, you know, spread across a bunch of uh, nodes. But we want a single uh, data type uh, for representing that. Okay, so um, so it's maybe kind of a, a weird uh, thing to get your head around, um, but yeah, just think think of it as a, a distributed collection of series uh, or streams, uh, and that that's what that's what a multi series is. <laughs> Okay, so then, and then there's like a, a library of operations that you can perform on these things. Um, so, you know, you can map over them and that's going to map individually over each series. We can filter it. We can, uh, you know, count. Okay, but then the, the interesting part is when we are doing things to, um, like when we have these this this multi series, when we're doing things to somehow bring the multi series um, into like convert converge the results in some way. Uh, so here, um, what am I doing? I'm I'm take I'm I'm reading from some Kafka topic. I am creating a multi series from that. Um, there's potentially a lot of uh, concurrency, you know, there could be multiple uh, partitions of that topic uh, that are being read from simultaneously. So when you are mapping, when you're filtering, when you're counting, that's all operating independently on each of the uh, partitions. Um, and so it's only when you call, when you say mix here, that is when like, you're basically saying like, okay, take all these, these separate, uh, uh, stream computations that are running on different locations potentially and have them, you know, gossip or exchange information such that they eventually all converge to having the same uh, count of um, things that they've seen uh, from that topic. And, uh, and then this last line is kind of the kicker, uh, which is that Imagine if you didn't have to do anything at all to uh, make the state of the uh, service uh, persistent. So you just say, um, you know, okay, make that series durable, uh, make this multi-series durable, and then it's this is sort of an idempotent thing. So this this whole thing has a hash, and if I say uh, run that service. Um, and I, and I run it again, like maybe I shut down the service and I, you know, start it back up again, it is going to resume itself from, uh, the last state that it was in. Um, and so like that, that would be sort of like a super nice, uh, ergonomic way of, of defining services where you don't have to write any sort of manual serialization code or, or anything like that for like figuring out how to persist uh, the state of your service. Um, which is not to say you, you could still persist the state of your service to, you know, Postgres or whatever, if, if that's what you want to do. But um, I think for a lot of these sort of, um, if, if you're just trying to get something done quickly, um, I think this, this kind of thing where you're just sort of leaning on some generic content address storage layer um, is, is super uh, compelling. Um, you might also have like uh, another another way of of storing. So you might be like, oh, this is just ephemeral. This is like I'm using this service to build up a cache. So I might just do a multi dot ephemeral, basically saying like, okay, save save the state of this, but not in durable storage, which might be backed like by S3, say, but um, store it, you know, just on like local disk cache or something like that, that you don't mind if it if it disappears. Um, okay, and then this uh, count function, and this is just showing that like map and filter, you know, these are not like built-in primitives. These are like things that anyone can anyone can construct uh, using this pull ability. And so this pull ability, uh, you know, just lets you. So you say multi.new, and then that puts you in the pull ability, 
And then when you're within pull, you can pull from multiple other uh, multi-series. And so you can pull multiple things and, you know, transform them and, and do whatever you need to do. And so, you know, it's meant to be very straightforward to build up uh, functions like map and filter and count and, and whatever other things you can imagine. Um, okay, so that's pretty uh, speculative, but I mean, I think this direction is like very exciting. Um, okay, um, someone brought this up earlier um, and I, I can't remember who, who, the, who the speaker was, but um, so the other is Unison for front end development. So it would be awesome if, um, you know, you could write front end uh, code in Unison and then the way that you talk to the back end is like the back end is just another location where you can fork computations. And it's a location that has a particular type. So it, you know, doesn't support arbitrary IO. The back end does not support arbitrary IO. It supports some API. But then um, there's no like issuing JSON, you know, or sending JSON blobs over HTTP or whatever, or any of that stuff on the front end. You literally just move, you know, fork computations on the back end and, um, you know, get back, uh, you can just get back your results. And, and, you know, I just think that this could be super nice and um, I'm excited to, uh, you know, pr pursue this. Um, definitely very underexplored as well. Okay, and then uh, the last thing is, um, okay, so early on in the history of Unison, um, I was very interested in building a better front end to programming. Um, I don't know how many folks have seen this video, but um, uh, I was like, I liked the idea of having a structural editor where you know you you couldn't have parse errors, uh, you couldn't even have type errors. So like in this interface, it you know anytime I'm filling in one of these blanks, it actually knows what the allowed types are, and it the it would not even let me select something in the autocomplete box that didn't type check. Um, which maybe that maybe that's a little bit too too um, rigid, but um, anyway. I think this this direction was it was very exciting to work on, but um, we kind of put it aside because there are just so many other things to do, and also it is really hard uh, to build things like this that actually feel uh, fluid and like pleasant to to use. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of work on this area and, you know, not, not just in unison, but other, other projects. And um, yeah, so I, I, I'm excited to, to be able to pick this back up again. Um, I think that this is a, a thing that could really make uh, unison programming a lot more accessible to more people. Um, because I think, I mean, just the the over the basic experience of like writing code in a text editor, submitting it to the compiler, and then getting back uh, type errors or parse errors that are often not that good. I mean, you know, we do try to make an effort to to have our our errors be you know decent, but like it's just a, a really hard thing to do, um, and it's just. Um, in some ways, I think an interface like this can just vastly reduce the the learning curve uh, for getting started with with a with a language. Um, so maybe it wouldn't be for everybody. Maybe you know not everybody would use this. People will still use their text editors, but I think it could just lo lower the barrier. Um, and so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be able to pick this back up again. Um, okay, so uh, just wanted to close out. Um, with um, I, so we are launching, you know, this new version of Unison Share, and um, we have this welcome screen when you sign up. And uh, I really love this line that um, you know. So it's hello, hello, so and so, welcome to Unison Share. We are really excited that you're here and can't wait to see what you do with Unison. And that is totally true. Um, 
cannot wait to see uh, you know all the all the awesome stuff that that people are going to build with Unison. And um, yeah, just thanks so much for for being a part of this um, and for for um, you know helping to make make the Unison community a uh, you know a great place to be and a, and a, a great place to uh, spend time. So yeah, thanks again. Um, I am going to stop there. I will hand it back over to Runar for some closing remarks. And uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll be hanging out in in the sessions uh, afterwards. Thank you, Paul. It's inspiring stuff. Uh, and, and Paul is battling a, a cold right now, so thanks, Paul, for powering through the through the cold to yeah to, to talk <laughs> two talks today. So that's the end of our conference. Uh, sessions and chat will be open and hop in uh, until the end of the hour if you want to hang out for a bit. And we can all obviously always hang out in the Unison Slack and, and you know, other GitHub and wherever. Uh, recordings of all the talks are now available in the replay section, uh, except for this one, which will be like in 10 minutes or something. Uh, so you could watch a talk you missed in that, uh, in that hour. We will post all of the videos to YouTube sometime, sometime in the next few days. If you enjoyed this conference, I would personally really appreciate it if you could tell your friends uh, about the conference and about Unison. You know, tweet something out uh, about the conference and tag the, the Unison Twitter account. And uh, on behalf of all of us at Unison Computing, I just want to thank you all for coming to our conference. It has been a real pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, we had 360 visitors. I think it's pretty good. 360 people decided to spend their Friday together talking about this new programming language, Unison. And I want to say a huge thanks to all of our generous speakers for taking the time to develop the and rehearse and, and give these awesome talks. And thanks to all of you for, for coming with us as we journey on to the future.